war will put an end to everything. Very often the most brutal and shockingly horrible crimes were committed in the name of this slogan. Yes, of course, a conflict of this magnitude could not but be accompanied by massive crimes against humanity with violations of morality by every conceivable and inconceivable law. Second World War was by far the bloodiest war in the history of mankind. And we will not speak today about the crimes of Nazi Germany, but we will touch upon the crimes committed by one of Germany's most powerful allies, and if being more precise, Imperial Japan. Exactly like the Nazis, the Japanese brutally exterminated prisoners of war and civilians in the occupied territories, abused, raped and tested chemical and biological weapons on those people. They mocked human conscience and dignity. They practiced so-called death marches when prisoners of war were sent on foot for 100 kilometers or more, in unbearable conditions in the heat with practically no food or water. The constantly beaten column of people was following a set route. This was a road to nowhere. Many, unable to withstand the beatings, overwork and thirst, died on the way. There is no exact date on the dead, as the Japanese tried to eliminate any information confirming the unflattering facts of their crimes. Just as they once destroyed documents about another very shameful page in history, namely the Solace Stations. And the saddest thing is that they cleaned up their mess so well that they went unpunished. It was not until decades later, in late 2000, that the International Tribunal began investigating the atrocities committed by the Land of the Rising Sun during the Japan-China War against girls who had been made sex slaves, or, as they were later called, comfort women. The Tribunal decided to convict the highest military officials of the Japanese army, all the way up to the Emperor whose guilt was obvious. None of the victims were willing to talk about all that had taken place in those years. As of the year 2000, there were only 60 people who were able and willing to testify, women of many different nationalities from many different countries. China, Indonesia, North Korea, the Philippines, South Korea, and Taiwan. It was clear from their words that all the sexual crimes had been committed with the approval of the Japanese government. The victims cried out to the conscience of the world, to justice and retribution. We accuse, they said. So what did they manage to prove and who was punished at the end of the day? It all began when Lieutenant General Yasuji Okamura, Deputy Chief of Staff of the Shanghai Expeditionary Army, began receiving reports about the lawlessness of Japanese soldiers. They were accused of raping local women, which increased the negative sentiment among the population. To solve the problem, Okamura proposed the creation of so-called comfort stations. In the beginning, it was assumed that Japanese women would work there, voluntarily. So the very first comfort station was opened in Shanghai. But Japanese women were reluctant to go there, and as the need for such facilities increased, women from the occupied territories had to be recruited. They were deceived, promising well-paid work, which in wartime for many was an absolute necessity of life. But later, the girls ended up being barbed wire in the barracks and became sex slaves. There is no exact data on how many women lived and worked in the comfort stations. Some believe that there were 200,000 of them, others that there were 400,000. And the survivors themselves preferred not to remember what was going on at the time. Military field brothels were supposed to function on a 29 over 1 basis, which meant that one girl had to serve up to 30 soldiers. But in practice, there were not enough women, and female workers had to serve from 50 to 60 soldiers, and sometimes even more. Over time, the work of the consolation stations was brought to automatism. The amount of time a soldier could spend with a comforter was strictly regulated. Many women died because of their mistreatment. They were beaten for the slightest offense and beheaded for more serious disobedience. According to official statistics, 9 out of 10 women could not cope with the experience, which resulted in suicide or an attempt at suicide. As the business became more popular, more and more women were needed. But neither deception nor promises of large wages worked. The recruiters began kidnapping girls on the streets and buying them off from the poorest social classes for the money of their relatives. But even so, the problem had not been solved. There were still not enough women. So the next solution was more radical. Prisoners were used as the consolers. 
When the topic was raised, only Yoshima Seichi, a laborer from the Yamaguchi society, had the courage to speak out. I was a hunter for Korean women in the brothels for the sexual entertainment of Japanese soldiers. More than 1,000 Korean women were taken there under my command. Under the supervision of armed policemen, we kicked the resisting women, taking their babies from them. We sent them as cargo in freight cars and ships to the command of the troops of the Western Section. Without any doubt, we did not recruit them, but forcibly kidnapped them. The rate at which such facilities were springing up was frightening. In China alone, the Japanese leadership established more than 300 comfort stations for Japanese soldiers and officers. There is very little data on military field brothels in other countries. Their number is not known. But one thing is certain. We are talking about more than 400 comfort battalions. The women in such institutions began at the age of 11 and ended at the age of 30 odd. Their living conditions were appalling. Wooden barracks housing 10 people. Sometimes all the modest furnishings were reduced to a couch, a sink and a mat. The girls were forbidden to leave their quarters. In reality, it was a prison where so-called comfort women were mocked, raped and sometimes killed. All of this was very destructive to the women's psyche. They actually resigned themselves to the inevitability of death and often tried all kinds of ways to bring it closer. Sometimes it was an overdose of opium stolen from the soldiers and sometimes a rope from their own belongings or even a bullet. But this was not the only reason for the high death toll. Japanese doctors, like their Nazi German counterparts, conducted horrific experiments on female brothel workers. The main problem of consolation stations was women's pregnancy. Therefore, the comfort women were poisoned with drug 606, which contained a large dose of arsenic, which really helped to solve the problem of pregnancy. Women had miscarriages, infertility, and sometimes the arsenic dose was lethal. And women died. Information about these crimes came to light accidentally after the tragic events of the Nanjing Massacre. Pictures of military brothels were leaked to the press, causing public outrage. But the Japanese leadership refused to acknowledge such a phenomenon in the occupied territories. They came to the comfort stations themselves. The girls worked voluntarily. They were well paid. These were non-state and commercial enterprises. These are some of the many excuses that the leadership have thrown to journalists to hush up the scandal. The first time the authorities apologized to the few survivors and their loved ones only in the 1990s. However, in 2007 the Japanese Prime Minister said that a tribunal was looking for the perpetrators and it actually found them. But there was no evidence of the abuse of women, nor was there any evidence of the imposition of such a lifestyle on women. This statement sparked a public uproar. Because of the outcry from progressive countries, including the United States and others, as well as the public outcry the Prime Minister of the Land of the Rising Sun had to admit the existence of comfort stations and the violation of human rights at these stations. But the Japanese government was not willing to compensate for either moral or physical damage. The countries whose women suffered at these stations were outraged and openly criticized this resolution of the situation. The United States, Canada and the European Parliament demanded that Japan answer for all the war crimes of the time. These events were covered in the piece A History of Korea. The small amount of evidence was due to the fact that in an effort to hide its crimes from the Allies, the Japanese army destroyed its sex slaves and any documents confirming these crimes when they retreated. Shocking data, just think about it. Out of several hundred thousand comfort women in the 1990s, only 200 former sex slaves were registered in South Korea and 218 in North Korea. Since their inception, the comfort stations have been used by between 50,000 and 300,000 women from a huge variety of countries. Even reports of more significant numbers appear at times. Shattered lives, broken destinies, children who were never born. But Japan tried with all its might to maintain its position. It never repented, never apologized for the violation of human dignity and crimes against humanity. But there were those who said that such brothels were necessary. The mayor of Osaka, for example, said that the comfort stations were necessary to maintain discipline and to give soldiers a chance to rest. 
but in the same statement he admitted that most of the women were not volunteers. And only the Minister of Administrative Reform Tomomi Inada condemned her colleagues and said that the whole women's consolation system was a severe violation of human rights. And just now, 70 years after the end of the war, on December 28, 2015, the Japanese leadership acknowledged the existence of military field brothels and the brutal treatment of women in these establishments, and announced its willingness to pay compensation to the victims of those brothels. Now many books have been written about the tragedy of the girls caught in military field brothels, many movies have been made, and there is now an opened museum. Subscribe for more videos.